Hello, everybody. Andy Jacob here with the .com Magazine Entrepreneur Spotlight Series. Settle back in your chair. Get ready even to take some notes because we have an amazing guest on the show today. And of course, for all the people that love watching the show, you know we love bringing international award-winning and worldwide leading experts on the show. And we have an international award-winning cybersecurity expert on the show today. He, of course, is the CEO and founder of Sciology Labs, and his name is Mr. Terry Cutler. And we found out that he was able to pull 30 minutes out of his schedule to come on the show today. We were just so excited, really a leader in data defense. And we have so many questions about Sciology, and so many things are happening in the world today that we need more ethical hackers on the scene like Terry and his team. So Terry, welcome to the .com Magazine Entrepreneur Spotlight Series today. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited. How are you, Andy? Hey, I'm doing great. I'm doing great. I asked the questions here, but that's really <laughs> funny. I love it so much. And of course, you have a great mission statement, really keeping an eye on the, your security, your customer security, and everything you do at Sciology really is positioned perfectly to protect your clients. But before right. we get started, let's pull the lens back to 30,000 feet. Tell us about Sciology Labs, and then we'll get into it. Sure. Well, Sciology Labs is, is a data defense firm based here in Montreal, Canada. And like we said, we do business around the world. You know, Most of our stuff is from Canada, US, um, Dubai, Bermuda, Algeria. So we do a lot of business in around those areas. And we really protect small businesses mostly. This, that's our sweet spot because we know that the cyber criminals know that they don't have the time, money, or resources to deal with cybersecurity. And they, they're actually the number one target. So we're there to help them. I love it. Let's talk about the types of companies that reach out to you. And then we want to get into cyber. I mean, we want to talk about it. We've got you on the show. We only have been able to get your time for 30 minutes. We have so many questions about cybersecurity and hacking and all the countermeasures and the bad things that are going on out there. But what types of companies reach out? What's that first conversation sound like, Terry? Well, we, we we have customers that have two employees all the way up to customers with 1,200 employees. So we can service all of them. Um, typically, it reaches out to, oh, Terry, I think I've been hacked. Uh, it's things like, uh, hey, my mouse is moving by itself. Is that normal? <laughs> and then they find out that their, their company is actually infiltrated. And then they get hit with what's called a ransomware attack. This is where a, a malicious software got into their environment and started scrambling all of their data and holds it hostage until they pay a ransom. And the ransoms could be hundreds of thousands of dollars to millions of dollars. And then you're going to be faced with two choices, pay the ransom or lose your business because a good chance your backups aren't working either. Wow. There's so many infrastructure vulnerabilities. There's so many current threats across so many different platforms and systems and devices. And of course, you have the ability to deploy tools and really procedures to remediate prob problem situations actually before they even occur. Let's talk about that. You have the people that reach out and say, hey, I've got a big problem here. I mean, something just happened. I don't know what happened. I don't know how it happened, but somehow I'm in a big mess. So yeah. we have that group of people. Then you also have the people that reach out and say, we don't want that mess. So let's talk about those groups of people as well. All right. So a lot of times, whenever we bring a customer on board, we 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 kind of we kind of talk to them, find out where they are, where they are now, where they need to be, and where they should be. So we ask them questions like, "Okay, do you have? Uh, are you working with a cybersecurity expert?" Yeah, the answer is usually no. We have our IT guy, but the IT guy is like your family doctor, right? Would you ever ask your family doctor to perform, to perform laser eye surgery on you? And most people would say no. So so that's your IT guy. Uh, are you having any monitoring of your of your environment? Are you doing any dark web monitoring? Now, the dark web, like, oh, I've heard this term before, but what is this? So the dark web is basically the criminal underbelly of the internet. That's where all the cyber criminals are selling sensitive information, like your passwords, for example. So we could perform a dark web scan to see if your passwords have leaked based on your company. And from there, we pull up the, the this list in front of their face. They're like, holy smokes. <laughs> this is, and we find out that a lot of the times... These cyber criminals are using these passwords to log into their inboxes of their emails, pulls down sensitive information. It could log into their, their company because maybe through the VPN. And they stay undetected for a minimum 260 days before being detected. And that's where the challenge is because they're, they're, they're dormant in your environment. You have no idea they're in there. And they're in there you know, trying to crack new passwords, trying to gain access and a foothold into your environment. 
and then from there, you know, steal your data and, and hold you hostage. Harry, that's crazy. They're inside a system yeah. for 260 days before you even know about it. And they're in there tinkering around and discovering things and investigating and testing penetration tests and the whole gamut. When we think about it, you know, we think about people working from home, of course, we think about people going back to the offices. When they walk into an office with their cell phone, and now everything's talking to everything, and we've got dishwashers that are talking to the cell phone, and we've got, you know, vending machines that are now talking to, you know, uh, people's computers. How much more complex is the entire infrastructure of data defense now versus the way it was, let's say, 20 years ago? It's going to be a mess because cybersecurity is not about convenience, right? So every, it's everyone's responsibility to secure their environments, including home users. So what's going to happen is the more and more devices we bring online, um, the worse it's going to get. Because if let's say you bring up, uh, you remember a couple of years ago, we had a big problem with baby monitors where they would install the baby monitors and then you left the default admin admin access turned on. So hackers were getting in and talking to your baby at two o'clock in the morning. And you would think there's an intruder in the house or your smart home was online. Now to get access to your lights. So you'd be having a nice dinner. All of a sudden your lights are fading and it feels like there's somebody in the house spying on you. So it really messes with your mind. So uh, I think what's going to happen is there's going to be what's called a supply chain attack. This is where, let's say a a fridge manufacturer uh, or, or a coffee machine manufacturer could get hacked. And we're seeing this already. And it can manipulate the code, which then all of the appliances that you have will get the infected version of the software, which then can shut down your appliances uh, or, or, or make things happen. Wow. It's crazy. And of course, you offer what I call a multi-tiered end-to-end solution, which is really designed to really simplify and optimize the countermeasures that allow organizations really to assess, verify, and mitigate their exposure. How long does it take once someone reaches out to you, Terry, they say, hey, we need you, we need help, to put in place the types of measures that you've become known for in the industry? Unfortunately, it, they, only, they, they often come to us and, com- and companies like ours when it's too late. They've already been hacked. Um, you know, This could have been prevented. Let's say an audit could have cost you three to $10,000. Now you're paying hundreds of thousands of dollars in remediation. You're paying legal fees, fines, uh, you know, insurance things because now insurance is going to say, "Oh, did you did you do all the basics to protect your environment?" And most companies don't have that basics in place, and now they're declining their claim, and now they're stuck with the bill. So we've had we've had cases where like a dentist office got hacked, um, and he was being managed through a managed service provider. So it's like your IT, external IT firm. So the IT the IT firm got hacked, and they took control of his company and logged into forty customers and ransomed them all at the same time. So when you look at a dentist office who get hit who got hit with a bill of uh, three hundred thousand um, it, dollars, it's very 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 painful. Wow, I mean, you think about it, you think you're protected, you think you have insurance, something happens terrible, you go to your insurance company, they say, hey, did you follow the basic procedures necessary for this coverage to be in effect, and yeah. you, you did declined. <laughs> well, here's the, here's the problem, right? Because the insurance company now is, is tired of losing $5 for every dollar they bring in because they're paying out a ton of money right now with ransomware attacks. Now they're going to say, hey, you want to you you be uh, insured? Are you using two-step verification? Are you using patch management? Are you doing all these things? And if the answer is no, sorry, buddy, you're not, we're not sh- insuring you. Wow. And of course, you have a national partnership network. Let's talk about that, your, your network with some of the you know best and brightest IT technicians you know throughout the world, specifically in Canada. Let's talk about that partnership network and how that works. Okay, so in cybersecurity, there's people say, okay, I'm in cybersecurity or in IT. They think IT's got everything covered, but they don't, right? So you got your your IT guys who are the generals, then you got cybersecurity experts that are specialized, and we don't want to do the IT day to day stuff. We leave that to those guys, but we complement each other. So sometimes the IT guys think we're there to steal their jobs when it's far from the case. Um, so what happens is we'll come in and do an audit on a company or who's been a victim of a cyber crime, and we have to do what's called an incident response on their system. That's where we come in with specialized tools and do forensic analysis to see how they got in, uh, what needs to get fixed up. And then usually what happens is 
we, when we deal with uh, larger companies, they have multiple offices across the world, or in our case, would be for Canada. And within one hour, I could tell you if those techs are available in those regions. Within four hours, I can possibly get them on site. So we have that partner network that allows us to deploy these technicians to help get boots on the ground to help them get back up and running as quickly as possible. Yeah, and quick deployment is so important, especially when you're in a ransomware attack. Let's talk about the bad actors for the people watching the show. And again, the people watching the show, we hope you love what's going on here. I mean, Terry Cutler, we're going to get into it right now. So the bad actors, I mean, a lot of them are state actors. A lot of them are just actors of bad hackers, and they want to, you know, illicit money. So when we think about it, we've got a group of people that are trying to build things to sort of end around data defense. And they have people that they give these programs to, and they say to those people, hey, here's a bad program. Go see how much money you can get out of a certain sort of data program. And we want to cut of the action. Is that the way it works? Yeah, it's actually worse than that. <laughs> so uh, the common question I always hear is that how on earth are these people not being caught yet, right? So here's how it typically works. You have a group of folks that are maybe are in a country where they have low monthly uh, wages. So let's say a company makes, or so let's say an individual makes uh, $500 a month. Now, with, now he can buy what's called a ransomware kit. So he can find a cyber criminal and be part of his affiliate network. So now you can get what's called a ransomware as a service. So now you get part of this group. The group will actually give you 24 by 7 technical support. So here's a list of all these potential targets you can get. Let's go and attack these folks, and you'll make a cutoff of everything. So now you're hiding. These guys are hiding behind what are called VPNs. So they're hidden 10 times through a network. So the moment you think you've got one access, he's already hidden nine more times. So you don't know where he's coming from from the world. So attribution is nearly impossible a lot of times. And now this guy who's making $500 a month could now be making two thousand a month, ten thousand a month, and and with very very little risk of getting caught. So we've we've seen ransomware gangs that have made ninety million dollars in three months. So it's extremely lucrative for them. It's like it's th- it's a three trillion dollar industry. I have heard of this ransomware as a service. I mean, that's a yeah. scary thing. Yeah. Where yeah. do they find it? Is it on this dark web? Is that as you call it, uh, Terry? Where do they find it? Where are these? bad actors sort of doing their affiliate business as a ransomware as a service model it's insane yeah it'll be through the dark web for sure they'll, they'll 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 find a connection in there and learn more about who they're talking to and then uh uh you know hire them wow and the people at the top of what I'll call the pyramid i guess for lack of a better term they're constantly trying to develop new bad things to deploy for their affiliates is that the way it works yeah. They, so also on the dark web, they're also selling uh, live access, which means that let's say uh, your company's been infiltrated and they know for sure that they have access into your environment. Now they're going to go over and say, okay, hey, I have access to this guy's company. I'll charge you $500 for it or $1,000 for it. And now you get access to the guy's environment and now you can do whatever you need to in there. You have full admin access. They're completely undetected um, because there's so many ways that they can hack into your company. They can, they can send an email, which is usually the phishing attacks. Now, once a phishing attack is, um, is initiated on, a, on an endpoint, on a, uh, on a user's computer, they click on a link they're not supposed to. Now they become an insider. And now most companies don't have proper detection technology in place to know there's a hacker in there. And worst of all, they don't have a proper response plan to get him out once he's been detected. And that's where the big problem is right now. Wow, it's very interesting and it's scary. Well, or- because the, the other thing too is we're seeing that like... Uh, a lot of the executives still have that old mindset. Well, I have an antivirus. I have a firewall. I'm safe. But these are traditional technologies that can be easily bypassed because hackers are right now are not wasting time trying to hack your firewall and get detected. When all they have to do is send an email that says, hey, Andy, I was on your show a couple of years ago. Here's a link to it. And you click on that link. It's not your typical Viagra e- emails, right? <laughs> you click on the link. And next thing you know, malicious code has been written on your, uh, launched on your computer. And now he's ac- he has access to it. Wow. Is there a difference between computers. In other words, if I have a group of people that are running, let's just say, you know, iOS or Apple, or I have another group of people that are running, you know, Acers or, you know, uh, Microsoft, do they both have different types of vulnerability or is one better than the other? All right. That's a great question. I get that all the time. 
if I, do I, if I have a Mac, am I safer than Windows? The answer is yes, out of the box. So Mac out of the box, you have very restrictive access uh, to the system file. So you're just a regular user. But if you want to install applications or do other things that are more advanced, you have to type in a master code. But on Windows, it's the reverse. You have full access on your computer. And then if you want to shut it down, you have to, you have to limit your access. Um, but now what we're seeing is we're seeing ransomware attacks coming from Mac now. So it's, in, it's, it's, it's the first of its kind came out about two weeks ago. Wow, so interesting. It's coming. Interesting. So let's just backtrack it now because we have all these bad actors. They're part of a crazy, almost affiliate program. They're finding access on the dark web. They're actually providing access into systems for a fee. All these bad people out there that are doing really bad things. Yeah. And then we have the good guys, the people running their business. They're trying to do it right. And they get hacked and they have yep. the ransomware that shows up. Yep. They reach out to you. Hey, Terry, we've heard about what you're doing. What are the steps or the questions that you ask them so you can figure out exactly what's going on and what type of attack it is? Well, the first question I could easily ask them is that when was your last cybersecurity audit? And a lot of times they'll be like, oh, we never had one, or it's been five years ago or so many years ago. And things change too often. So one of the services we offer is what's called the penetration test. And what happened, this is where you hire us to legally hack your company and help you find all the holes before the bad guys do. And one of the things that can happen during this test is as, as we're attacking you, we want to make sure you're receiving the proper alerts. And because a lot of times the IT guys are so overwhelmed by how much email they're getting that their 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 alerts are just going into a junk mail uh, or another folder that they're not, they're not monitoring. And a lot of times they don't even see us coming. And then from there, we can help maybe deploy what's called our managed security services. This is where we're going to be monitoring your, your computers, your network, and your cloud security all in one dashboard. This is, and, and what's happening is, as I mentioned earlier, right, once a hacker gets into your environment, he can stay undetected for months and years. But with our, with our systems, it looks for a weird behavior. Why is this computer trying to access all these other 50 computers and trying to access the passwords? And that's not normal. So we can block that computer, that access. Or if they have like what's called IoT devices, Internet of Things, these are like sensors, uh, uh, oils, uh, maybe you have an energy company and you're looking at uh, uh, like um, sensors that, that monitor pressure. Well, you cannot install software on those devices. They, they have no memory on them. So that's why the network sensors will monitor to see if there's any beaconing out. This is where your if your phone and all these things, they always try to talk back to Microsoft or Apple. Those, that's normal behavior. But maybe these other devices are talking back to cyber criminals is what we're looking for. Wow. So, so we have the cyber criminals that are looking for money, not only millions, but billions of dollars. Yeah. But then we also hear sort of the nightmare scenarios. And I wanted to ask you about this. And and I don't want to be a doomsdayer, but you know, we hear some stories about, you know, state actors that want to shut down the grid and shut off yeah. the water supply and do very nefarious things. In that particular case, is that a more obviously a more difficult type of a hack to perform? And is that where they penetrate the firewall, or is it still something where maybe somebody opens up an email and all of a sudden we've got a power grid failure? Okay, so yeah. So usually what happens is there'll be some type of phishing attack. Somebody clicked on something they weren't supposed to. But because this is customized malicious software, a lot of times the technology that we're using today might not pick it up because it's known as what's called a zero-day attack. A zero-day attack means that no vendor on the planet knows about this flaw yet. So, so this is customized code that's been written by a government uh, entity. Uh, so they'll bypass it and they'll stay dormant, completely undetected until something weird happens. That's when they'll get found. Um, and they're going to tunnel their way through to see what they can get access to. And they'll keep running new code to stay undetected. Um, because as we said, you know, World War III was supposed to be uh, done with uh, computers. We weren't going to see bombs and stuff. We were going to see electrical grids shutting down. Uh, like what we saw in Ukraine, actually, we have what's called a wiper attack. So it's the same concept as a ransomware, except instead of encrypting all of your data, it wipes it out completely. You, you have a total data loss and there's no way to get it back. So we're seeing all these types of cyber attacks happening now. Wow, it's crazy. We think about it, it's really could be a very destructive thing. Yeah, Let's absolutely. talk about AI just for a minute. I know you, you talk about that. I know you get invited out to a lot of different conferences. You speak on the daises. You're 
you know, a speaker that's uh, very, very uh, wanted by a lot of conferences to come out and talk about cyber. How does AI fit into the whole cyber security space? Are we worried about AI, you know, figuring out the best way for the nefarious actors to attack the data defenses that are currently out there? Yeah, it's actually really scary. And we're starting to see some, we starting to see some misuse right now. So for example, let's say we're doing a test on a website. We know there's a flaw there. We can actually copy the code into AI. AI will analyze the code and say, oh yeah, there's a flaw here. <laughs> It'll actually do the work for us. And then from there, they can run an exploit code, which will get past that vulnerability. We're seeing other types of scams. For example, if you if you upload your voice into uh, the AI, um, it can actually uh, mimic your speech now. So you can actually do a uh, like a, a phishing attack or what's called the CEO scam. This is a scam where, let's say, the CEO calls you up and say, "Okay, Andy, we have uh, we have a special project going on right now. So I need you to wire twenty thousand dollars to this bank account, but don't tell anybody about it. It's top secret. Go ahead and do it." And it's the guy's real voice. So a lot of times you might not know it's him. It's not really not him, I should say, and you'll end up doing it. So. You know, and or the other one we saw it would happen on the news where the AI mimicked a child's voice that was uh, being kidnapped and being held for ransom. It's crazy what's coming. It's gonna wow. get worse. It's crazy. So, for the people watching the show, you need to reach out to somebody that understands it from the back end, someone yeah. that really gets it. You know, someone that understands not only what's happened prior. But what's happening now, and more importantly, what is coming down the pike? And Terry really has that expertise. He stays on top of it. We don't want to ask if you go to the dark web to sort of hack the hackers because you're a, you're an ethical hacker. But I would imagine at least the governments, or let's say the United States government, they have to try and stay in tune with what's yeah. happening on that dark web so that they can stay ahead of what's happening before it comes. Is that something that occurs? Of course, yeah. So we get we get uh, we get contracted to do some government work all the time. Um, what we're seeing a trend right now is, is obviously more and more individuals at home are getting hacked, right? We're getting a ton of calls from individuals. Oh, my Instagram account got hacked, or or their their financials are being attacked at the bank, and it's 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 very difficult. That's why it's important to learn cybersecurity at home. So this way, when you go into the, to the workplace, you're going to have that knowledge already that can help you. Yeah, that's great, Terry. Very, very interesting. And of course, you have an amazing app called Fraudster, and people are talking about it. We'll we'll try and put some screenshots up so people can see it. But tell us about Fraudster and how easy it is to use and why it's been developed. Sure. Okay. So one of the things was, um, so I've been in cybersecurity for a long time, right? So as an ethical hacker, I had the knowledge of how and why hackers are getting in. So I felt it was my duty to train the general public on how to keep safe online. Um, so fast forward to all these years, won all these awards, all these things, but I put out a lot of content. So I got over 39,000 students in my digital course. I have best selling book. I have all these things, but the comments I was always getting from individuals was, oh, Terry, I don't care about cybersecurity. No one's going to want to hack me. I don't have time to read your book. I don't have time to read your blogs. I don't have time to watch your videos, whatever the excuse was. But if I had you in my pocket, it'd be better. So it made me thinking. So for seven years, I tried to figure out how and why would a customer download this app. So now uh, there's an app that we developed called Fraudster, which allows you to, to allows us to send out push notifications of the latest frauds and scams to watch out for. So, so this app was developed for the consumer, but we also felt that, hey, it's the same scams that are happening to business owners, business VPs, whatever it is. So we have a section for them in there as well. And of course, we also have a section for the IT cybersecurity guys that are monitoring the trending pieces of what the latest scams and hacks that are happening. So what's really like what is a section in this app that really makes me proud, which is a crowdsourced crime fighting system. What this means is that if you receive the scam that's not in our system yet, you can upload that scam and the details to it. We're going to validate it, and if it's if it's if it's good enough, it's legit. We're going to push this out to the rest of the app community so that they can stay up to date. And maybe some other people have some additional info they want to add to it, so we can help solve cybercrime. All right, let's talk to the startups. We have startup founders that are watching the show. You know. They're so busy trying to get their minimal viable product out and so enamored with their technology, if they're a technology yeah. company or a service or a product, that they're not thinking about hacking. They're not thinking no. about, you know, that's the last thing on their mind. So maybe we could just give some pointers yeah. to the younger entrepreneurs about what to do, bottom line. All right. 
So there's obviously some basic things you can do. Make sure you create a strong password. And um, you want, a lot of times you want to create passwords that are 16 to 25 characters long. A lot of people think like, is this guy nuts? Like, how do you remember a password this long? But if you can think of song lyrics or phrases, it's going to help you on your way. So here's a quick example. I had a great day at work, 2023 exclamation point, right? Simple phrase. But if you remove the spacing, capitalize each letter of the word, that password alone will take 10 years to break. But if you replace the O's with a zero and the A's with that symbol, it'll take like 39 centuries to crack. But if you have... If you don't have this other feature installed called two-step verification, this is where you're going to either enter your cell phone number into the service or use Authenticator app where you have to enable a six-digit code along with your access to be able to get into the service. Um, you can also get hacked that way. And um, they can do what's called a pass the hash attack. So I'm not talking about the good old college days here, Andy. <laughs> this is an attack where they can actually log in as you without ever knowing the, what the password is. So that's why that two-step verification is extremely important. Um, so that's, what's one, the one thing, make sure your patching is always up to date to make sure your software is up to date. Um, the, the problem we're seeing with, with, uh, startups, especially around, around, um, the web developers is that they don't code with proper, they don't code with proper security in mind. So they need to get audits done as quickly as possible to know that they're vulnerable because we've seen a lot of startups where they want to work with banks or other big companies. Well, those big companies are going to audit you to make sure you've got the basics in place because you're going to be representing their brand with it. So, so just because you're a startup doesn't mean that you're not uh, you're not immune from cyber criminals. Wow, Terry, of course, the Business Development Bank of Canada, the BDC, approved a non-dilutive financing to help fuel your company's strategy. They believe in you. Yeah. It's a crown corporation and a national development bank wholly owned by the government of Canada. So that's I mean, that's incredible. Let's talk about that just for a minute. How did that come about and what is that all about? Well, we, you know, we got approached and saying, hey, you know what? We think you'd be a company that we'd, we'd be interested in funding you. And uh, so we, you know, we showed them behind the scenes of what we're doing and such. And not everybody gets selected by the BDC. So they obviously liked what they saw and they, and they got us uh, uh, some money to help grow the team and, uh, you know, get the managed services in place and things like that. Yeah, it's incredible because governments are very worried about what's going to happen and they need to align themselves not only with government workers who are the the white hackers the people that understand cybersecurity but they need to align themselves outside of government agencies and outside of their government employees with top-notch individuals and companies in the private sector because that's the only way really I see that this can be battled and you can put a combat helmet on. Am I thinking that clearly? Yeah, you are. Right now, so we have a shortage of about 3 million personnel worldwide in our industry. Not enough cybersecurity experts to protect everyone. And a lot of times, like you know, if you work for a company, um, the wages are much less than if you started up your own business and take the risk and do it yourself, as you know. Um, so that's important that government teams up with private companies that can help complement them and their staff to help protect the uh, the country. Wow, interesting. You have clients outside of Canada, many yeah. in many different countries. So what challenges does that entail because whether you're sending people to those countries or you're doing work virtually, don't you have a potential challenge of somebody sort of seeing what you're doing internationally somehow by hacking the hacker, I guess. So how do you stop that from happening so that the hackers aren't hacking the, the ethical hacker who's trying to help data defense? All right. So there's, there's, there's some technologies in place we can deploy, which is also known as a honeypot. So we can deploy some systems. And um, then from there, we could see if anybody's attacking the website, for example. And when it starts attacking this website, it starts finding these hidden web pages. And they start interacting with our stuff. We can kind of geolocate where he's coming from. Now, obviously, if he's coming through a VPN, uh, it's very hard to like triangulate him right away. But if he starts interacting with our stuff and starts loading up what's called a JavaScript, we can send a command down to his laptop that says, "Hey, do me a site survey of all the la of all the Wi-Fi in his area, and, and 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 let's see what you have." But when but when that scan happens, all the Wi-Fi's in his neighborhood are triangulating within five five meters of his computer. So that's one way we can actually find out where where he is. Wow, <laughs> there's so many things you have. There's probably 
a hundred things you can't even talk about on this interview that uh, you know and that your team has privy to. Shh. <laughs> wow, I just find it so fascinating. I'm going to bring you back on the show. We're going to talk more about this. I mean, the technology exists to do this, right? I even had the capability of turning on the guy's webcam, taking a photo and sending it back to me and say, oh, it was that guy behind the screen. But now we just violated a privacy law. Wow. So, it's such a crazy world out here. You know, recently, I somebody left me a voicemail and they said it was about an Amazon delivery. And I called and I could tell it was a call center. And I watched some of the YouTube videos of the guys that, Hack the bad hackers. And yeah. I knew it was a scam, but I said to myself, that's all they do all day long is they just try and scam people. And and yeah. my grandmother uh, was scammed. My mother-in-law was scammed. I mean, it's a terrible thing going on, Hunter. Before I let you go, I want to talk about entrepreneurship because here you yes. are. I mean, you're leading this you know great company, Psyology. I mean, you're an international and award-winning cybersecurity expert yourself. People are watching and they're saying to themselves, if they're younger, hey, maybe I'm having a tough time in business. Maybe I'm hitting a wall. Maybe I'm hitting a pothole. Maybe I freeze in the frame. So maybe you could share some insight to the entrepreneurs that are maybe having a tough time in business on what it takes to keep on pushing through and coming out the other end smelling like yeah. a rose. <laughs> I haven't slept in seven years. <laughs> I just turned 24. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So obviously entrepreneurship is is can be very, very painful, right? They think that, oh, it's a straight line, but you know, as you know, there's pitfalls and waves and all these things. Um, there's a lot of challenges. So I think the number one thing is patience and really understand who your target market is going to be. Um, like I, I, my entrepreneurial journey was, was uh, you know, had a lot of ups and downs. You know, I went to business with the wrong people and ended up, you know, almost going into bankruptcy and starting all over again. Now I'm in a much better spot. But uh, there's a lot of ups and downs, and some of the downs can be really down. So yeah, patience is the key. Yeah, keep on pushing. Have the patience. Surround yourself with the right people, people yeah. that care about you, people that have a common theme with your value system is very important as well. I mean, this has been a great interview. I'm so happy to have brought you on the show. I have another hour worth of questions just to get started. So we'll, <laughs> well bring maybe you back, give you one Terry. more tip. Maybe I give you one more tip. Yeah, if, let's go. One thing you can do is what's called modeling the masters. So you look for someone who's done it before, study what he's done and mimic him. That's one of the fastest ways to, to your success. I love it. Model the masters for the people watching. Take Terry's advice, get the two-step verification immediately and away we go. Thank you so much, Terry. This has been a great interview and thank you so much for coming on the dot-com magazine entrepreneur spotlight series today. Thanks for having me. And also, again, if, if everyone, anyone wants to uh, stay up to date with their cybersecurity, especially if you're a home user, uh, you can download our Fraudster app, which is available on Apple and Android. Uh, you can either Google Terry Cutler or Fraudster or Psyology, and you'll see that app. It's totally free. 